All right, welcome back to the Mason Cox Show. We've got someone I'm actually kind of nervous. I'm a bit nervous to actually interview because um, I love my cooking. I love everything about this man and what he stands for. Uh, we have a bit of a background before we introduce him. He's an actor in the comedy series Lowdown. He's a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and Government from the University of Kent. Was a DJ and a punk rock musician. This is probably not what people know you for, but also is on ABC Radio on Saturdays. Food writer for Delicious and Taste Magazine. Now we're getting there. World's best food journalist in 2008. Creative director of the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival 2005-2009. An international sensation and master chef in over 170 countries around the world. And now I might have to update this one, but has at least four best-selling cookbooks. Matthew Preston, Welcome to the pod. Mason, what a fantastic honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm loving what you've done with the van. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a genius. It's a great little um, unique kind of way of doing podcasts. Yeah, it's great. Now, I love it. Is it four best selling cookbooks? Uh, eight. 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 Wow, double that, and we'll get yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know look, I, that's why I think I've probably reached that point now where I'm sitting there and going, Maybe not for a couple more years. You know, you, you get, you get, I'm, but they're good. I, no, no, look, 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 they've grown really well. People love them. Uh, it's great to, it, there's nothing better than meeting people that actually now have one of your recipes as in their repertoire. Like that's mm. the, the, your bolognese is that their bolognese oh, or, that. or a dish that you've come up with that they, they cook regularly. That, that's the, that, that's the ultimate accolade for a recipe writer because that's what you want to try and do. You want to, you want to, the book has to be living. It has to get yes. dirty. It has to live in the kitchen. Um, but but there's also that point where you know I did a I did a, veg, a vegan and vegetarian book two years ago. I did a kind of history of food book the last last year. So I'm now I'll take a take a I'll take a and I'm, after that last one I was like no, I'm not going to do anymore. And then last night I woke up and I went, oh, oh. There's, that, there's that recipe and there's it. Because I think yeah, I think I think you can you can only do it when you've got stuff to say. Yeah. There's no point putting another hummus recipe, you know? Mm. If you're not teaching people how to make their own tater tots or mm. or teaching people how to make a, a vegan mayonnaise using using chickpea water, then then you're not doing your job. Just hacking out the same beer can chicken or or the same recipes that have been lots and lots of other cookbooks. And let's face it, there'll be 70 or 80 cookbooks released every year. And I I reckon eighty percent of the recipes will be the same. garbage. You know, well, no, they won't be garbage, but they'll be they'll, they'll be the same. You know, yeah. do you need another? Do you need another? Do you need another recipe for meat life? You yeah, know? okay. You know, we need the best recipe for meat life. And Which if you is find in your book. Well, no. Give, well, no, a, give, the, no, give the latest book a shout out here. Uh, what's the no, latest no, book? No, the last what's the, what's the, the, the name? No, no well, the last one was, was that kind of, I think lots of people did it. That was the the lockdown labor of love. So normally yeah. it was quite quick to write. Um, but this world of flavor took me nine, ten months because I went and tried to find out the, the true history of the 100 best dishes in the world. Yeah. So I went out there and I looked for the what really was the truth behind the pavlova. Was it really originally... Um, uh, Australian, was it New Zealand, <laughs> or was there somewhere else there? And and the answer is the answer is it's very clearly it's very clearly Australia's claim is is far far better than New Zealand's. The, you know the the recipe that everyone cites in New Zealand as being the original Pablo recipe actually was written by an Australian who'd also put it who'd also put that <laughs> recipe in her own Australian cookbook. Uh, two years earlier. So, but then the weird one, that one is with Pavlova, which you yeah. mentioned, is that the there's a there's a thing called the Schramm tour, which comes out of Prussia, Germany, and and the earlier and the so I'm looking at chasing those recipes down, and the earliest recipe I could find for a Schramm tour came out of a German language newspaper in Texas. Far out. So so and I think they also okay. you also find it in Wisconsin as well. So it's a weird idea that actually if Australians are going to argue about who's has the rights to Pavlova, yeah. it's probably it's probably um, it's probably German uh, heritage settlers in the US versus versus Australians and New Zealanders don't get a look in. So, so stuff so like it's, that's great fun to do. So it's maybe one of three different areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a mix of yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but I think, so that, that's the thing. You always, you know, what tends to happen now with the internet is that one, someone makes a claim and it gets repeated and repeated and it becomes mm. true. And it's actually nice to kind of myth bust some of that, unpick some of that. So I, I did that, but it's incredibly labor intensive. You end up, you end up reading, um, reading documents in Korean or trying to translate <laughs> stuff from high German using using your minimal high German skills. Um, but but it was but it, that was really satisfying in terms of finding things like the first the first spaghetti bolognese recipe um, uh, that I could find anywhere in the world. Everyone thinks it's an English recipe is actually four years earlier in Adelaide. So stuff like that's kind of surprising yeah. and and good. And then the other thing about doing that kind of research is finding out that the you know Masman curry that great Thai curry which mm -hmm. has a has kind of um, Arabic or Indian antecedents. 
students because it was originally made by by uh, Iranian traders, um, by rich Iranian traders in the old Thai capital. But but when you look at the old recipes, from the earliest recipes, written recipes are probably in the 1800s. They all use um, they all use a bit of squeeze of, of bitter orange juice in there to brighten up the richness of the coconut okay. curry. And so when you do that, and that, so that that gives you a new take on the recipe. So sometimes a new take comes from up here, and sometimes it comes from researching and finding and finding a great idea that they used to do 200 years ago that we don't do anymore. And you, when you do it, you go, oh, that totally changes this dish. It brightens it up. It's fantastic. <laughs> Just in those three minutes, I can tell already how much you actually <laughs> love food, man. Like, yeah, there's, there's some people, you know, they do the job and it's their job, and there's some people that do the job and it's their passion. Uh, and uh, that is you one on one. But, uh, like. but I think that's, I think that that's that. It's the old cliche about never work a day in your life. Uh, my old yeah. man was a was a naval journalist. It was his hobby, his his obsession. Um, my, my my sister was a tennis journalist and now works in tennis. That's her obsession. Yeah. If you can find a way of making of making your job the job you love it's fantastic it's one of the things where i get quite upset when i've met a few over the journey but when you meet footballers who who hate playing the game yeah. and and you've got they've, they've they've achieved what when they were probably eight or nine was the dream yeah. and then they get there and they, they don't like it and they don't love it and it's like it, it that's so hard that's so hard to do something you thought you'd love and then discover that that, that that you actually you're not you're not getting off on it. Um, so I think if you can find those things, and I'm very lucky, I'm very lucky that have that I have for my thirty or so years in Australia, I've never done a job that I didn't didn't yeah. wake up in the morning and go get excited about going to. Well, I'm not. I think I've had one morning where I didn't want to go into work. That's that's insane, and, and that's something I'm incredibly thankful for. Yeah. I've been very lucky for. That is amazing, man. Well, I'm going to start this off. I want to ask you two yep. questions. Now, these two questions I'm going to ask you now, but you're going to answer them at the very end. So I'm yeah, going to give sure. you a little bit of time to sure. think about them. Two questions. First one, what's your easy go-to dish to impress yeah, that sure. anyone can do? Yeah, sure. Second one, what is your weirdest thing you have in your kitchen at the moment? Oh, yeah, okay. All so right. I'll let yeah, you think on yeah, sure. Simmer on those no, for a bit. No, no, no. no. I, I simmer on yeah, those easy, for a bit. Easy, um, easy. We'll have those a little bit yep. of that. But we'll start back originally. Um, I've got a really kind of weird question. Yeah. I said this at the beginning. Um, you're a punk rock musician at one point in your life. A lot of yeah, people I don't I'm, know. I, you know, when I, when, I, when I started out, music was the thing I loved the most. And I, it still is. I mean, I, I'm obsessed with music. Um, I, I, we'd go and see bands the whole time. You know, back in the back in the day, the podcast was a fanzine. We, we my, me and my best mate Jeremy used to do fanzines together, design them, write them, go to gigs, sell them. Um, I then I ended up working in a then we ended up working for a, a ma like a What's On magazine in in London called City Limits and and getting to put on shows um, and getting to put on bands, which was fantastic. So we did things like you know the first time Nirvana came, they came with Tad and Mud Honey, and and oh, yeah. we were and we were involved in putting that on. So. I love that stuff. I'm a, I'm a, I still play guitar. I'm terrible at it. Really? Um, I've got, I've got the front, the front room of my house is set up with a, with a. I've How many got, gu guitars do you have? Uh, I've got three. Three. So that's okay. That's that's not that's too good. You know, I, for I'm a guy not, who's a food critic to have three guitars. No, but, is no, but, no, but I remember, I remember, <laughs> I remember talking to Kurt Pendelli, who obviously played in excess, and and he has a, he has, a, he has a little flat, I think, in Potts Point, where he keeps his. 58 guitars. 58. He's got a house just for his got guitars. Little, he's, got, he's got a little, little like soundproof one bedroom. We can go over there if you want to see them. They're, 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 they're living on their own. So, yeah. So, so look, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I played through university in, in bands. We were always, we were always terrible. Um, we had no chance of ever getting a deal. But, no uh, reunions but, uh, coming? No, 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 <laughs> reunions. No, no, when he's very, no, reunions, no reunions coming. Um, and, but but, but I, think I, I loved it. I think there's there's some, what it is, right? Food is a very individual experience. Yeah. Like maybe you can go out with a group of people and, and I've done it. You go out when you have something, you all have a degustation, you all have one dish and it's so beautiful. You look around and people are in tears. And that, yeah. that's that's the ultimate moment in, 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 in dialing out. But it's so rare. Whereas if you go to something like Glastonbury and you stand there with 70,000 people People singing along to Paul McCartney or singing along to Radiohead or singing along to Oasis. That, that that's a magnificent experience with, you know, so many more people, a true shared experience that heightens it. Football's the same, you know. Yeah. You, you without get, the crowd, it is totally different. Without, without, without we saw that, we saw that during during lockdown, without the crowd and playing, but just going to see it, you know, mm. you want you want the roar of the cow, you want you want the singing. And obviously growing up in the UK and growing up, you know, five minutes walk from Stamford Bridge, one of the great football stadiums of the UK where Chelsea play and having been going to that stadium since I was probably seven, eight, um, you know, that, 
that that communal singing, that that communal experience of, of communal pleasure is absolutely central to who I am. So food's a bit, it's a bit rare like that because it's not mm. really a communal thing. Although we talk about going out in groups, it's a different sort of thing. It is something you talk about. I, doing a bit of research on you, you talked about you going out and food is not the main thing. It's actually the people you're with. Yeah, of course. And I find with. that I find that awesome. As a food critic, you would think, oh, he's just all, all about food, taste, flavor, palate, everything else, right? But yeah, I find it amazing that you take that and you go, no, no, that's just the conduit to the actual night of entertainment. And that people are the most important thing that makes a meal impressive. Uh, ab absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I think and I think if you I always, you know, that realization came from being asked, right? A list of my fav favorite meals, my five favorite meals in a year. And mm -hmm. they all started with, you know, with my England mates going to Copenhagen to eat at Noma. But it was started with, you know, with my with my partner, um, with the woman I love, with the it started with the person first and then the experience. And and I think that's one of the things when you when, when you when you're looking at, at where to go, I mean that's the thing. People always say, Where's the best restaurant? You go, Well, who do you want to go with? Yeah. You know, the place you're <laughs> gonna want to go with 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 the woman you're romancing, with your best mates, with your girlfriends, they're all different. Mm. They're all different. And and often the most important thing, the most important thing is the is to not, and this is why service is so important, to not let negatives derail the night. Like, you know, a, a meal with with that's that's tasty and fine and service is great, is okay, is good. You're gonna enjoy with your friends. That that's not gonna derail it. Um so so to a degree that's more important to have an absence of negatives rather than have amazing food, terrible service. Yeah. Or terrible food, amazing service, you know? A negative would, would derail the night and will stop you having having pleasure. Having said that, you know, a great night out. I went out the other night with four friends. We had we laughed pretty much for, for three and a half hours. Um, but there were some really good lamb ribs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> With really good, like you know, the, when the fat gets all, all, all like broken down, oh, and yeah. crispy, um, and 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 that that was the moment when everyone got, you know, you're all laughing and talking, and suddenly, and this is a great moment when you eat out, and the table goes silent. Silent, yes. Oh, and, I and, love all, that. And, and then and you just hear a little bit of <sighs> the, the involuntary <laughs> sigh, which is one of the, using one of the, all your senses for that moment. <laughs> yeah, well, that, so I think so. I think that's I think that's I think that's kind of a that's sort of the benchmark. Um, mm. But but again, it's you know that and that's the same when people come around to your house. Uh, you know, I always when people are talking about cooking dinner parties or, and I think that's why dinner parties is the concept is kind of something that sort of disappeared. We have people around, but the whole idea about about cooking for other people is it's an absolute negative. Just don't yeah. don't don't stress it. Don't do three courses. Don't do stuff that's going to stress you out. You know, do, put tasty on the table and everyone's happy you don't need to do you don't do need to do a and, you know it's the old italian idea that um some beautiful you know some beautiful fresh tomatoes a little bit of mozzarella some fresh herbs bread i mean <laughs> yeah, well, simple things in well, life <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, it's it's you know a bit of salt we're, we're, we're kind of we're kind of nailed yeah. so i think sometimes we get we let the kind of the the pomposity of and the the showing off nature, because obviously there's a big element of of eating out that's about showing off and about mm. conspicuous consumption. But I think that's probably the the least interesting or attractive part of eating out or or having people around. Yeah, and it's it's the cliche of it is very much like some I think is some of the most amazing meals I've had. And it's with my friends or my family, and it's the situation of life of where you're at, and maybe a conversation you have that's oh, you know life changing that, that goes to put you on a totally different directive. And and I think that look, I think that in terms of those those key moment stuff, there can be a pizza on the table. Yeah, you know, it, it's probably more likely to be a pizza on the table than a than a nine course degustation. Bizarrely, well, because you know, the moment you go into a gastro temple and you, it's all quiet and it's all about the food, you, you know, I don't think that that's a bad experience. But it's a bit like going to church, and I don't mm. think that's necessarily not necessarily fun. Now, I've got a lot of fan questions at the end, mm. but you did mention pizza, so I'm going to ask one of these fan questions yep, early. Yep, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh, you've heard I mean, it here first. No, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I tell you why. I tell you why. Pineapple on pizza. Pineapple on pizza because when you because when you um when you're out at a really bad pizza joint, the pineapple is a, is a reliable addition. <laughs> it's like you know what I mean? Like yeah, that's right. It's like ketchup, but very similar. It's it, that's a very smart thing to say, Mason. It is like ketchup. The ham and pineapple. The ham and pineapple is always the one if you. Go to a bad pizza, like a really bad pizza restaurant. The ham and pineapple will hide, will hide all the sins of all the dough. So, so that that ham and pineapple would be my go-to in a bad pizza restaurant. If I'm in a great pizza place, 
it, it probably won't. It, pan, pineapple won't, won't, won't be, be number featured. one. <laughs> and, and if I make pizza myself, pineapple doesn't doesn't figure. But I think it has its role. Okay. And I like the idea. It's you know, I like again. That's another one of you know, everyone. Hawaiian, the, the Hawaiian pizza didn't start in Hawaii. Supposed to started by made first by a Greek guy in in Canada, actually Portland, Oregon. That Far someone out. someone dug up a menu from Portland, Oregon in the late fifties, and there was a Hawaiian pizza on there. From so Portland, Oregon, inventors of the Hawaiian pizza. People would have thought he was absolutely crazy. I'm sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I mean, I mean, he had capsicum as well, which I think. Well, you know, capsicum. That's like, a bit odd. Like like ham and pineapple, I get because you know that's gammon steaks in England. But but the, the moment the capsicum gets in there, question mark. Awesome. It's like it's like the moment you put you put you put an egg on your gammon steak with your pineapple, egg and pineapple. <laughs> not a really really just not a very bad idea. Well, we'll go back to I guess what brought you to Australia. Now, sure. obviously from England, and you actually came over here for something that's actually just wrapped up. Uh, that's neighbors. right. How sad. I know. Now, well, how do you feel about the whole thing? I mean, it's been a long running TV show for, for ages, I feel like, in Australia and something that's very iconic to this town of Melbourne and of Australia in, in, in general. How, what's your thoughts on everything kind of finishing up? This is one of the things that kind of got you to this country. Yeah, no, no, it was. I, I came here to write about Neighbors and Home and Away. That, that, was, my, that was my job when I, when I arrived here and I did it for, for five years and I watched every single episode for five years. Um, uh, look, I think in terms, I think, in terms, there's a whole lot of things we're gonna we're gonna lose. Um, we're gonna lose an amazing training ground for Australian actors. Mm, very true. And certainly, when when you go to Los Angeles and you talk to people there in casting about why they they love Australian actors because they've they've done an episode a day. Like, like they yeah. they 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 have learned on the job. They're quick. They're efficient. They're they're, they're loved in by Hollywood casting directors purely for that reason. We're gonna lose that. We're gonna lose that expression of Australia. That, that we put out, that we put out through the world, through all those different places that that, that, had, that had the show. You know, yeah. that there's that lovely idea that in in Milton Keynes, which was a new town in England, they spoke with an Australian accent because the only really? the only unifying um, inf influence they had on accent was Australian soaps. All the Far kids out. watched Australian soaps. They started to speak with an Australian twang. <laughs> so 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 that that that's kind of good. And I think it's a great way of us selling the, you know selling this image of a, a of an of an inclusive. Of an inclusive Australia, it's a not you know um, other reasons to 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 be sad about it. Um, I think it's a very much a an expression of Melbourne. Mm. Um, I love that idea that people would come and want to go to Pinhoke Court to yeah. see it. Um, I I was lucky enough to get invited to do an episode and the thirtieth anniversary and get to spend screen time with the great the great Dr. Carl Kennedy, Alan Fletcher, which was. Fantastic. Um, yeah. that they, they were they were masters of what they do. So it was, but yeah, I mean, like like all these things, we all have our we all have our use by dates, or, yeah. or, or whether you're a talent on the show or whether you're as a show. Um, and it, but I think it's just a you know it's a it's a pity that nothing's replaced it. I think that's yeah. I, I think it'd be fine if there was another show that was that's coming out like where spin off or something. Spin, yeah, or on, yeah, yeah or, or or just somewhere where 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 you know there aren't many. There aren't many great outlets for young Australian actors yeah. to go and work on. You think of the amount of drama there's out there. There's really not a lot here, um, and and that provided both uh, that home and away provided so many great gigs for for so many young Australians to kind of to cut their teeth. And whether, yeah. whether it was a as a as a principal role or just doing, you know, just coming and doing four episodes and getting a bit of experience and something for your something for your showreel. It just feels. I feel like every actor actress that's out there that's in mainstream kind of movies now. You saw about Margaret Robbie. I think was on one of them. Margaret Robbie, Guy um, Pearce. Yeah, there's uh, so many. Chris that, Hemsworth. Chris. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I mean. I mean. It, it's a. It's a. It's a Long, it's all part of the chapter of life, and life. And, uh, and I think that that's the thing. It's a bit like losing. It's a bit like losing, um, you know, apprenticeships at, at hotels. You know, they're, they're, you you unpick a level of of training that actually enriches the skills of the people that that, that we want to you know, we surround by. We want we want great actors. We want to see the best actors. We want we want our actors to be amongst the best in the world. We want our our cooks to be amongst the best in the world. You know that's that's mm. sort of the, the dream. You know AIS supposedly gives us you know the best the best sports people in their chosen field as well. I think it's you know that's one of the one of the ways we express ourselves as a country. And we're a, you know we're a pimple on the on the the back end of the world. But you know that culturally it's really carry your weight. You definitely well, you carry know, your that, weight. And that that that's that thing that we never understood. I think we were, then we were making a, a TV show, making MasterChef in a shed in on the showgrounds out, out in Flemington. <laughs> And then you go to India, and it was massive, like yeah, six million, crazy, six million people watching. But but also, it, you know, they they saw a they saw 
a cast of people that were incredibly diverse. I mean, they saw a they saw a show where people were respected. They saw a show where, where people got on. You know, they're all the all the things that we'd like to. I think if we ideally were saying what's the Australia want to live in, mm. you know, they're all there, and it's good to be able to it's good to be able to project that um, at a time when you know the, 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 you know at one point when there were all those racist attacks going on against taxi drivers, and yeah. there was a perception of Australia being a ra really racist country, and we've not got a great record in that area. So, so anything that we can do to 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 show that you know to show that it's not the case is, is uh, in terms of culture is fantastic. It's it's pretty crazy, and uh, you probably wouldn't realize this, or I'm sure you do, I guess, to a certain extent. But how much MasterChef probably shows Australia to other people? Like I've, I've read something that people are learning English yeah, in right. India yeah, off yeah, MasterChef. That's right. Cool. The emerging and, middle class started to do it, but but it's also in Portugal, and it's also yeah. in in Brazil, and oh. yeah, you know, I was at an elephant sanctuary in Sri Lanka, um, <laughs> and these Bulgarians came up to you, spoke no English, no Sri Lanka, <laughs> and came up and said, "You're uh, MasterChef, right? Yeah." MasterChef. So, so I think that that idea. Yeah, that idea of um especially i think because the show also was very was very was very supportive that i think it and that i think is very much an australian trait i think that uh, that that's that's really nice that people picked up and identified that in all those markets and it's a weird thing you know i was was standing in the in the in portugal airport and this woman came up to my my, my wife and said here's my number if you have any trouble that translating you just want put me on the phone and i hope i'm happy to help you with the love master chef and, and we're just, <laughs> everywhere we went around portugal people were doing this really nice acts of never had to learn any portuguese <laughs> never had to learn any portuguese but but also from my perspective i mean that's the other thing you know to be able to to have a, a little level of recognition or notoriety is fantastic mm. because it means that I can talk about food yeah. wherever I go. People want to sit and talk about food and they'll tell me what their grandmother cooked. And so in terms of finding recipes or getting inspiration or or just having a good, you know, talking about food, it's a great way to get to know people. It is funny. I was actually at a friend's place in Sweden. I was, was a friend of mine from high school and I had yeah. seen him probably five or six years and I was staying at his place and um, start talking about different TV shows and whatnot. And they go, "Oh yeah, we we watch an Australian show, you know, yeah. it's Master Chef." And I said, "Oh, I know a guy from Master Chef." Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, "Oh who?" And I was like, "My presence." She was like, "The cravat." And I was like, "Yeah, he's gonna make one." Like, she was just like lost her mind. They're like, "Yeah, I knew you." But, like, but but isn't but you see, I think that's also really funny as well because it's because it's Melbourne and everyone basically does know everyone. Um, there's that there's that lovely thing that you know it is it does anchor this idea you know that the, the People talk about that they bump into, you know, whether they're doing business in India or they're doing business in Venezuela, and it comes up and do you know? And they go, yeah, of mm. course, I'm from I'm from Melbourne. You know, if you're in Melbourne, you you will have seen you will have seen someone, you will have seen Andy, or you would have seen you know, you would have you'll see these guys around the traps. So you're you're kind of like it, you're it, connected. It, you're like you're automatically style, and that's what we're, I think when we're traveling, we're always looking for connection, aren't we? Yeah, oh, 100 percent. Now talk about travel connection. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. One of my all time. Icons, I feel like, in the food industry. Yep. And rest in peace, Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, sure. Um, you have done a few different things with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, amazing and guy. You played an interesting game now in Trugo. I'm not sure if this is still played today because I was, no, no, I was no, looking still, at some stuff. I was, still, you can go up to Brunswick. I think there are two places playing Trugo, which is weird. It's sort of like a, uh, it's sort of like a cross between croquet and bowls i suppose yeah it's a great word it, it's a it's a really interesting, ga interesting game you, you it was originally it was um a game that was thought up by a, by a load of a load of track layers yeah, um, railway right, track yeah. layers uh, as a way of passing time using the mallets the, the sledgehammers they had and the and the i think it was they were and a and these little rubber kind of these rubber washers they yeah. big thick rubber washers on. so we went out to film tony was here filming um uh one of his tv series so we went out to we went out to play trigger and Tony was an absolute natural at trigger. Mm. It was really annoying. Like he was he was he was but but also he was like he was like he was like he he could have he could have formed the American the American team and been the captain. He was that level of good. He was really he, it was his hidden skill. I mean, kind of. He's like the only American ever played. He's kind of like that, me in AFL. I'm all American every single that's, year. That's, exactly, that's right, exactly. But but in this case, he was really really good. Basically, <laughs> like it like too. he was he was he was right up there. He, he was like the dust. Martin. Did he talk did he talk trash the whole time too? Um it was a typical New Yorker kind of like no, talking. There, there, there was there was a bit of there was a bit of trash talking, obviously, <laughs> because he was so good. And I think and I think because he was like, but isn't 
this is really easy. What's the problem? Kind of, yeah, you know, like, that kind of annoying when people got a natural <laughs> talent. So that that was fun. But no, look, it was great. I was lucky enough to film a couple of series with him and um, a couple of episodes from series with him, and also meet him for a few times for dinner and catch up with him. He's, he was a he was a great character, and he and he I think he brought a real a real looseness to to making that yeah. sort of TV. It was often very po faced and very much about and very much about you know the fancy restaurant and the white tie and the the guy with the French accent and the waist of the, the white gloves. And he was all about the the, the street and yeah. finding great food in holes in the walls and um and and in, in those kind of un, unlikely places, which as we know, the best food I find when I'm traveling is normally in homes or or, or you know in small street restaurants. Um, so that, that 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 was great. But yeah, he was um he's a, he's a big loss because I don't think anyone's come along who can who can actually has that kind of easy way with the camera. Yeah, and, and the way they shot it was really loose. You know, it was, was really it? well. They, they 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 they'd have this thing where they the editor would the edit they would have three editors working on the show. So the editor would, editor would work the the wide camera and be there for the whole of the filming. The DOP and the director would each have a camera. There'd be a sound guy, and then at the end of filming, say in Melbourne, the editor that that one editor would take all of the tape back and go and edit that that um that episode so having yeah. seen everything having <laughs> been there having shot the general vision having shot the wide stuff he would then go back and edit it and another editor would come in so oh, it was so really that, like, so it was really it was a crew of maybe five people but it, that's why it was so that's why the stories were so good because often what happens is you send footage back to an editor back you know home and they then you know, we talk about they, they they describe then filming becomes like making paint and the editors mm. paint with that they extract a story from the paint that they've got whereas in that case the story was he'd been there for the story so he told the story as it happened yeah. and that's a great thing with tony things could go off on an angle or they could they, they could kind of reach a dead end but that was fine you just moved on it was um it was felt very felt very real felt very real yeah. life what was his favorite part of melbourne Favorite, maybe yeah. I'll say what was his favorite cuisine while he was here. Oh, look, look, I think I think he really loved he really loved the the, the kind of the Middle Eastern Middle Eastern cuisine because it wasn't an area he knew a lot about. Yeah, okay. so I remember I remember we we took him to to a butchery, uh, uh, Turkish butchery, and we had sujuk, and he was like, I've never had this before, and I was like, okay, and he loved it. Um, but I, I think it's traveled all but, over. But, him, uh, but all I think I mean, but I think that's the thing. I think that's the thing with with the favorite cuisines. I think when you're someone like Tony, when, when, for most food lovers, you know, it, it's like, it's all great, you know? Mm. There aren't many, you know, there are some things you don't want to eat. There's some things specifically you don't want to eat and there's some cuisines that have more of those than others. But basically, you know, he could be in, he could be eating around the, the fish restaurants, around the fish market in Tokyo, or he could be, he could be, you know, he could be eating in, um, he could be eating in the, in the cinnamon, the cinnamon bun shops in Sweden or, you know, and, and he would, and he would find great joy and excitement because yeah. it's a, because it's an expression of place and expression of people as well. I think that's what he found was so good. He, he used food as a way of, of reaching an expression of place and expression of people. Yeah. He's a phenomenal person. And, Hey, someone, I don't know if you've seen the movie Roadrunner on his kind of whole life. No. It's, it's, a, it's really well put together. It talks about kind of from start to beginning. It goes into a bit of the background of how he kind of shot in the original first kind of days and coming through with Kitchen Confidential and everything else. Um, it's really interesting, just kind of a different like perspective. And for a guy who was very well known to kind of get a bit of a backstory of kind of what was going on in his life. Was pretty I, cool. I, I think what was interesting is, is that he wanted to go to places that were difficult as well yes and he wanted to try things that most people would not try yeah and, and but without it being without it being um i'm not gonna eat i'm gonna eat running yeah. shark you know yeah, it's yeah. kind of a, without it being a performance sport but i remember one time he went and did this thing where it was like you know the little suction cup things that athletes do yeah he did that but they were like pricking you and then pulling like blood from you and it was like this whole thing is like all over the floor. It was insane. I was like, this has nothing to do with food. Like, yeah, 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 <laughs> but he just yeah. was like, so and, I was trying, I was like, you gotta try this. And, and, that, <laughs> and look, and there, 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 there were definitely, but that's also, but, there, but that was great. I think great TV has a bit of madness to it. I think yeah. that, that's what you helped with Tony Bourne. You got a little bit of madness as well, as well as great stories. And that, that helps you not quite know what's gonna happen next. And that's what you want. You know, we were, the predictability of, of so much, um, electronic media you know boy meets girl boy loses girl blah, blah, blah. same know, story replayed same so it's exactly again and again it's like the same hummus restaurant the recipe will trade endlessly it's great when you get something new and fresh and we are you know i i believe just like we you know just like we have 
We have that I think called restless legs and we have restless palate syndrome. We're always looking yeah. now. Nowadays we're looking for a new and a what's a new what's so a much new? access to everything. Yeah, and, and also yeah. we're what we what are we, we gonna do with the Kit Kat now? What flavor are we gonna have? Wasabi, white chocolate, <laughs> matcha, you know? That now I mean having said that, ninety nine percent of the time, whenever there's that kind of brand extension or experimentation, the um the original is always the best. Yes. But but like it, shapes. But barbecue shapes, I've learned. Everyone says barbecue shapes original. The best. That's right. That, 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 that's right. The whole the whole shape. Well, and and again, what is the most popular chip flavor? You know, in Australia, it's salt and vinegar. One of the is old really? traditional ones. Yeah, oh. it always comes up. With it. And you, and you go, well, what about all the fancy, the truffle and the mm. and the you know per, Peruvian chicken or whatever it is? Any bizarre flavors? And it's like, no, no, no. It doesn't last. You know, well, but, but it's great for a moment. It's that moment. Yeah. Okay, try that now. Okay, oh, something different. You yeah, know? try oh, it. Move on. Yeah, something different. Yeah. Move on. Try something. Something different. Move on. Um, but which is why we're so well well served in Australia. Is there's always somewhere new and exciting to yeah. try. Often in terms of cheap and and being an expression of maybe a, a regional cuisine, which is fantastic. To it's very much. I like going to a Coles and you see the big Cadbury blocks, and you've got like a whole section just for the chocolate of Cadbury. And I'm like. Every time I rock up, I'm like, dude, there's six more flavors here. Like, what in the world? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and you know that you're never gonna you're never gonna buy the pineapple block. Nah. I mean, who? Well, who what's your favorite? What's who, your favorite? Oh, uh, I've got caramel or fruit and nut. Oof, that's good. They're, 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 solid. I, they're, they're, they be. Brains I reckon they're solid. Too. I reckon they're. I reckon they're, they're. They're solid. Um, you know, I don't mind a dark. I don't mind a dark mint. I mean, I do love a white. You see, but, ah. we, but you're not allowed to talk about as a food person. You're not yeah. Allowed to talk about white. People, people get very funny about chocolate. Like, or just people well, there like was it. an argument; it wasn't chocolate, but I think both the 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 US the the US Food and Drug Administration and also you have said that white chocolate is a chocolate. It's got cocoa butter in it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a common chocolate. You know, yeah, okay. It's a kind of it's a um, it's a stonewashed jeans of chocolate. <laughs> now, what's this? You've I looked up something the other day, and it was what was the most embarrassing meal you've ever cooked. And I think oh, there was yeah. one about you putting food coloring in yeah, mashed I got, potatoes. I was, I was, I was all excited. <laughs> beans. I, was, I was at university. It was a time in my life <laughs> when I was, green eggs and ham type stuff. I, I, I wasn't Mason. I wasn't making good decisions. <laughs> How old were you? Better um, question. I would have been. I would have been eighteen, nineteen years old. I, nice. I was. I was young. I was naive. <laughs> I was stupid. And I thought it'd be really interesting just to, to really interesting to like dye all the food. So we dyed mm. the we dyed the baked beans bright red. Um, we lots of cochineal. We dyed the mashed potato blue and. <laughs> And it was there almost was a fair amount of food coloring. I feel like too. To there was a fair amount. There was a fair amount of food coloring. But the bizarre thing was, psychologically, eating blue food felt really wrong. You know, there, yeah. it was. I mean, obviously, but that's the same taste. It's the same taste. Yeah, but the, but but mentally, it was like you know, you're you know, when it comes to you eat with your eyes, you kind of your eyes are going, "Why this is weird?" Don't, Don't have it. Yeah, no, no, that that, that that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't one of my finest moments. <laughs> um, but you know, but that's all. Yeah, I mean, you know, I look, I've got three kids. Um, when I'm when I'm when I'm testing recipes for a new cookbook, there will invariably be those moments where you get the the flicking bits of really? the side of the plates. It's so horrible. So you know, well, what's, occasionally what's one you that they've done that too. Oh, I look, that would be your hardest critics. Oh, like, yeah, abso the, absolutely, the absolutely the hardest critics. Um, <laughs> oh, I mean, with, with 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 you know this, they were probably worse when they were kids. But you know, just the the mere sin of cutting the zucchini in batons, not in rounds. The, They're that fussy. Oh, oh, Mason! Oh, you don't, wow! You don't understand what kids are like. Kids, kids will, <laughs> and then, then the week later, it'll be. Oh, I want my zucchini and batons not in rounds. So it's oh, uh, so it changes too. Oh yeah, like <laughs> oh yeah, and it changes between all three of them. You know, the, it, it was. I, I remember sitting there and going, "Gee, you know, that's like cooking for a food critic when you're a top chef is." Comparatively easy compared to cooking with your own, for your, family. your own family, your own <laughs> kids who have all these different, all these different kind of obsessions at different times. So, um, so yeah, so like that, that, that was, I, I think I made, I think the worst one was the sinner putting, putting capsicum in something and, and my daughter went through and picked out every piece of capsicum in and front just, of you too and put it around the edge of the plate. So when the dish was finished, there was a little kind of clock face of capsicum. It's like, don't do that again, Dad. All right? <laughs> or, 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 or the worst one is, let's not, let's not have that again. Yeah, it's like, Dad, let's 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 let this happen again, Dad. Okay. Do they they actually tell you it's not? Yeah, the yeah, oh yeah, no, oh no. I mean, no, no. My 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 kids are my, my kids are brutal. But I mean, <laughs> but you want it, you want it because then it doesn't it's go in the feedback. book. Yeah. You don't, well, you don't want to put stuff like that that in the book. You want everything. You know, it's got to be all through the no filler. I mean, that's the whole idea. You want it to be delicious because you know you got a responsibility when you write a recipe that that was if someone makes it at home, one, it's going to work. Two, it's going to look vaguely like it is in the picture, and three, it's going to be tasty because they're spending mm -hmm. not just the money to buy the ingredients but also the time but also you know it's the 
it's dinner for the kids that night. You know, it's yeah. about it's about you, you want to give people a win, so the kids go, "That was great. Let's have that again. Let's do it again." Yeah, the, 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 that's a staple. The, the, the ultimate, the ultimate accolade. That is funny. You got the gatekeepers at home making sure mm. that all the recipes in the book, very important, all approved by the press. Very, family. very important. Very important. <laughs> now, let's talk about something a bit off off this kind of mm -hmm. topic. Now, you've recently been in a car accident. Oh, no, 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 not recently. Sorry, you have long been in a car accident a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Long time sure. ago. Um, and that did that change your life perspective? Kind of. I know. Like, I feel like there's a lot of different things in your life that have happened. You've done everything under the sun I like researching you man you've been on radio TV you know yeah. you do the food critic stuff you do I'm very everything old. possible it makes them very old no, when, yeah, when, you get, no. when you get to my age you'll have done a lot as well you know that's you, the thing. you fit a lot in you um, fit a lot I, in I, I, I'm, I have a big attitude that, that if you're offered something no matter how weird it is you have a go at it love that why not yes. because why not Why not? If, it, if it scares you you do it if it if it concerns you you do it just you know and then you don't have to do it again but you do it once just to just because it's try it's, it out and then try you know it out and then who knows and then next thing you know you're you find yourself acting in Bold and the Beautiful, and you go, wow, how good is that Bold and the Beautiful? <laughs> Put it on the resume. <laughs> That's great. What even name it? But just be really annoying when you when you when when you're with a when you're with a top actor and you go things like oh, yeah, because I have done I've done a lot of Hollywood, I've done Bold and the Beautiful. And they go, What? What, what? what are you talking about? What? <laughs> and then, then they then they then they call it up on YouTube and go, It's terrible. Um but I think, like, uh, back to the car accident, I want to say, is like, was so, that a, because there's probably was a it, was few it, defining moments. Yeah, look, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether that's a, yeah, is that a defining, is that, is that that moment? Um, or maybe it's another one. Maybe it's something else that's yeah, really kind no, of changed. No, look, trajectory it's interesting. In I, car, I mean, I was, I went up, at university, I was convinced I was going to die before I was 28 in a white car crash. Oh. And then I would have, and that, this car crash would have happened when I was, about 28 actually yeah. and and it was the car was white we went off into trees and it was kind of like the premonition i had but it didn't die so so there's so there's an angle there that says there's an angle that did, did i then go ah oh, okay my 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 deeply held fear that i was gonna that time was limited that was yeah. was removed and that and that therefore you had to you had to you had to kind of live as if you're going to live till 70. I don't think so. I, I didn't have an effect on me. It was before I before I moved to Australia. Did it have an effect to me moving to Australia? Um, possibly. Because mm. um, when did you move to Australia? I moved to Australia in 1993. So yeah. so it would have been three or four years before then. I don't I don't think so. I don't think probably in the same way as you know, I came to Australia for I came to uh, uh, to Australia because I'd always lived in London. It seemed like a good idea to to try something Change different. Something that was a that was more of a that was more of a you know when you've grown up in a city like London, you've really <clears throat> only ever been there. You the, the this idea of living somewhere else seems so weird because London's mm. in America was the best city in the world. And then I then I moved to Australia and I fell in love with it pretty much um, almost immediately and and really you know within five years there was no no way I was going to go back to the yeah. UK. So I think that that was probably that was probably a, a bigger transitional moment. Obviously, me meeting my wife, which happened you know when I was here, that was a bigger transitional moment. Having kids is a bigger transitional moment. I think there are I think there are those moments. I think that I think often those transitional moments, rather than coming through for me, matters of trauma. It, it's when it's when you when you've yearned for something, and you achieve it, and then you go, what's next? Yeah. Rather than going, oh, you know, rather than going, oh, let's stay here. L yeah. This is really good. Let's go on and do something else. So yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a, I think that's a, um, that that maybe is in terms of my my kind of mental modus. But having said that, I did Master for eleven years. So mm -hmm. and we kind of, you know, year two was probably the, you know, the, they were the best in the ratings we were ever going to get. So I could have at that point if I. Maybe if I thought that. I mean, I I love doing that job. So, so, but again, I'm very lucky. You know, I get paid to eat cake. I've written, I've written for Delicious for for twenty years. Yeah. You know, I've been. Well, that, that's an crazy long time to be with with one place. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, and my wife my wife calls calls the team up there my family. Mm. I literally calls them a family because they are like a family. I've known them all for for so long. Um, so I think I think those things. I think that's where for me that you know. Although I say I like moving on, and there's also a large element of when I get when I find something I really love, you know, yeah. let's actually celebrate and embrace it and love it and go, how lucky am I to get paid to come up with recipes or to travel to Argentina to do a story on the food of Buenos Aires, and that's a job. I mean, that's a 
That, 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 that's, that's a dream. Dr- that's a dream for most people, <laughs> yeah. and for me, that, that that's a job. And then also travel with a photographer who's a, a close personal friend, and who we're going to have a really good time with, and we're going to enjoy the we're going to actually enjoy the experience with. Mm. Um, so yeah, no. That, so I don't think the. I, I mean, all I remember with the car crash was this whole thing of you know coming coming to and having the 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 the, the car had gone into trees and the bonnet the roof had been collapsed yeah. down to the the door jam level. And I, but I was able to kick the door open, and I was wearing a really heavy wax cotton, you know, like a barber jacket, wax yeah, cotton yeah, yeah, jacket, yeah, yeah. and it was covered in glass, just embedded all over. Jeez. It. So like, so like, so I was that was you know I've got one scar on the back of my hand, but that would have been the whole of my body would have been ripped up with all the glass that was driven yeah. into the thing. But luckily, it was all driven into into my torso into the jacket. So I took the jacket off, and that was thrown away. And I could use the jacket to hold the to hold the um. When the car had crashed, I'd obviously flown up into the air. I'd hit the the, the handle above the door yeah. on my upper arm up here, um, and I'd smash the the bone clean through. So that was just hanging loose. So, but I was able to pick up the jacket like that and walk. I mean, you know, it's like when you have when, yeah. you, when you're on the football field and you have a big injury. You know, you just the adrenaline's gone. Through you you, the you just deal with it. Yeah. You know, and it's okay. What's not okay is when you end up in the when you end up at the hospital. They're going, we might have to operate, so we're not going to give you any um pain medication oh. so but but we're gonna have what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to just separate you got you got a, a jiggy zaggy fracture here and the two the, the muscles have have, un, have knitted the bone back together incorrectly we're gonna have to pull those bones mm. apart and then we're gonna have to pop it back in so they knit and then they'll heal and then we'll probably put a pin in this is the eerie so i'm lying on i'm lying on the bed no meds i've got uh, no meds i'm lying oh. on the bed i've got three nurses on on this arm uh, pulling this arm down as the doctor's pinning my chest back and they pull the broken arm apart and then pop it back together again. Oh. So that was, and but it still wasn't childbirth, Mason. It was bad, but it still wasn't childbirth. Yeah. So oh, no. so I think, that, I mean, the thing, but, that, but the, so those things are kind of, they, they teach you a bit about yourself, but I don't, mm. I didn't suddenly go, I'll never let anyone else drive or, yeah. um, you know, or oh, my, I'm nervous when my kids drive, almost, I mean, I, any more than so than any other parent would be but yeah look so so i'm not a not a not a pivotal moment in my yeah not a pivotal moment in my life i found the normally the pivotal moments in your life are, are little things yeah you know that certainly the you know getting the phone call from a friend of, from with master chef i got a phone call from this woman she sounded very young like a like a like a um like a work experience kid working for a casting agency wanting advice on chefs um, mm. for, because they were making my chef. And so I gave her some advice and, and that, that phone call led to me being auditioned and then cast. Fine. So, but that, and that was totally, that's a totally random thing. Yeah. And I think that, that, that idea that opportunity knocks quietly is, you know, and that's one of the things we all have to learn is rather than shouting the whole time is just to keep quiet and listen for an opportunity knocks is, is really, really crucial really crucial advice because so many opportunities pass you by if you're not if you're not engaged and seeing what's going on yeah you'll be um, aware of your surroundings and, and, and opportunities being you know fun opportunities or you know i mean the radio is a great example of that radio is a terrifying prospect yeah i was going you know, to this but for yeah, someone for someone who for someone who's who's worked in tv you know not not not, not the journalist matt preston pre-tv but the someone who's worked in tv where if you say something wrong you can edit it you can cut it you can yeah. do it again to be live oof can be a bit stressful, and, and also no so one, ABC every Saturday. No else, by the way, everyone yeah, that's, that's right. listening, ABC Matt every, is on every Saturday. Saturday night. eight thirty, eight thirty to twelve. Last hour of sport. First two and a half hours is, is magazine stuff, so gardening, but um, available available on on, on the web. Um, but that moment when the when the red light goes on and the mic's there and you're by yourself and there's nothing else, they got no host to bounce off. You go, you just got to start talking. That, that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, I can see you. It's not like you're, a yeah, you know, like yeah, that's right. You're like, you know? it's, it's not easy. You know? People it's, think, oh, you just talk for a living. And it's like, no, you have to have things, everything properly structured, working your way into one thing to a next to make sure you cover all the different things that are going to be in the show. Yeah. Like, there's a lot that actually goes to it. And I mean, before we got on, we were talking about the research you do yeah. beforehand. And it's, it makes actually going live on air that much cleaner whenever you have an idea of kind of what you're going to go into and maybe some factual information oh, behind it's, it. It's, well, it's fantastic. And, and also you you also know when someone's bullshitting, um, which is another, <laughs> another plus. But I, I think it's I think it's that – but I think that that whole thing of um, – that whole thing of of – no safety net is really yes. interesting because we normally, we normally, as we get older, we get better at finding safety nets mm. and protecting ourselves. 
And it's good. And I mean, you'd find that, you know, football's all about no safety net, taking yourself to a place where, where, where you're, you're just, you know, where, where you're running backwards with the flight of the ball, not, not knowing who's coming towards you. Right. World. That's right. <laughs> exactly. I know, I know, but, but, you, but you do it. And I think that's a, I think it's a fascinating, I think it's a fascinating to overcome your, to overcome your natural fears to do yeah. something is a really, really interesting. Yeah, hundred percent. And, I want to ask you another thing. So we're going to wrap mm. this up here in a bit. Now you're massive, massive on Cole's second bite, which is a um, an initiative you you kind of become a part of. Can you give us a bit of a background of what that did? Yeah, look, I, I started um, second bite is a a charity that started as a, as Ian Carson and Simone Carson, a couple of Melburnians, going mm. to Pran Market and collecting produce that was kind of um that wasn't going to last until the next market day, and then dropping it off to charities. Yeah. Really simple idea. That's now grown. So smart. That's now grown into the biggest food food reclamation charity in Australia. Um, from I mean, we do we work with farmers, we work with all sorts of, of stores. Obviously, Coles is, is a big one. But just to give you an idea, last year from Coles alone, we picked up twenty two million twenty two million kilos of food mm. from Coles that would have gone into landfill. So forty four million, I want to say, so, meals that yeah, were made from it. That's exactly right. Which is so insane. so 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 that that ability when you've got when you've got charity struggling. Um, if you can provide them with the, with the free food for their for their, for their lunch program or as food to give out to, to to their clients, it's fantastically it's fantastically important. Um, so I've done that for ten years. The the charity has has gone from strength to thanks, thanks to really really good people within the organisation. Um, and and it's a and it's something I'm I'm very proud of. It that that whole idea we need to do stuff to we have a massive issue with food insecurity in this country. Yeah. Um, and we have a massive massive issue in terms of waste and it's just. I I love, I love a, I love an idea where you've got two problems. You've got food going to landfill that, that people could be eating, and you've got people with not enough food. And if you just put the two together, you solve those two problems. It's yeah. like, how clever is that? It's simple, it's fantastic. It's a simple it's a, idea. That such a simple, is so efficient. Such a simple <laughs> idea. So that, so second bite's a second bite's been a, been a, been a pleasure to be a part of. Um, and and again, you know, it, it goes from strength to strength, and I think people are, are getting a sense of how important it is. I think we all yeah. identify now as food prices are going up. So that, that you know, and and uh, the amazing thing we did a during the pandemic when everyone was obviously you know made was supposed to be self absorbed. Um, the amount of donations we got went up during the pandemic really? because people identified that, that there were people more people Indeed. were struggling out there yeah. and there was a need for help. So uh, I think it's fantastic that the that the the, the, the the Aussie punters are kind of supporting mm. Second Bite in order to do that job because again you know again it's that simple idea that for every. One dollar donated, second bite can redistribute enough food for five meals. So it's Pretty a, amazing. you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a small step to make, but it's a huge impact yeah. for so many Australians. And and when you hear the micro stories, when you when you see the, you know, uh, you went to a, a distribution centre recently, and um, it was a it was a charity that worked with um, Women's Refuge, wow. and, and they basically they basically lined up all these plastic bags were going to to women and families um you know in women's refugees and there was like a whole long line like maybe maybe 60 meters of bags and you go that's how big the problem is and that's oh, one man. of that's one of 1400 charities yeah so so when you see that sort of stuff you, you go it, it, it kind of redoubles your efforts to, to yeah. do more because you know it means so much i mean that whole idea not not just the not just the financial and being able to but just that kind of idea that that, that there are people out there who care and who want to and who you know food is a food is a, a an essential part to mm. to our well-being you know if we're well fed we're happy and so you know getting people fresh nutritious produce to eat should be you know if we can find a way to help Let's try and find a way to help. And I must say thank you because I actually went to a place called the Magpie Nest in the city. All right, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, uh, Collingwood's involved yeah. with, and they talked about Second Bite being yeah. one of the things that helps them with their food. So I've seen firsthand how impactful it can be to some of those people who are in the homeless community yeah. and get those free meals from a place like that. And it's, yeah. it is so amazing to see. There's even like a miniature community within that now because of the options and the availability of things like this. And I think that the Magpie Nest is a great example. Sacred Heart Mission is a great example that – um, Parramatta Mission is another example that, that, you know, if you can provide people with a meal mm. and, and that kind of support, they'll come in. But if you, these are marginalized people you don't, don't see community, we don't see them in the community, but you can, if they come in, you can help them with social services support, with dental, with medical, with mental health. So you can actually, you can actually help them 
become part of the community you can you can also help them in terms of providing other other services they need because otherwise they're really hard to meet so it's a you know it's a it's a uh, it all starts it all starts with a it all starts with a bowl of pumpkin soup so very true. simple it's or a slice of carrot cake Slice of carrot cake. I haven't actually said this yet on the pod, but I've got a slice of carrot cake for you to I'm, try. I'm, I'm very I'm, excited. I'm, I'm nervous. Very excited. <laughs> no, 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 You can't hold back here. No, no, can't no, hold I back. Can't, can't hold back. Who, who doesn't love carrot cake? I know. Well, it's, I, I, mean, I like to think it's a healthy cake. <laughs> it's not based on what I make so it with. How about, how about, <laughs> how, wouldn't you by any chance be putting a bit of oil on there by any chance? There is. There is a bit of oil. How much oil? Um, enough to enough. make it moist. And enough to make it moist. Yeah, okay. So there's a fair amount. And um, would that be cream cheese icing on the top? There is. Yeah. A bit of vi- uh, vanilla, a bit of yeah, lemon. Very nice. Lemon's got a little, little touch to it. I, I've got a, there's a you know, you know, so you know the history of carrot cake. No. Do you know, do you know yeah. where carrot cake, the first ever recipe, there are lots of carrot puddings that exist in medieval, medieval um, history, but um, the first recipe of carrot cake being served, it was served at the Francis Tavern in New York oh. when Washington and General George Washington had said goodbye to his troops after the British had sailed away out of New York. He had this big dinner for all his generals wow. and, and carrot cake was on the menu. And that was the first time. And that, that and that's the first time anyone can find a reference to carrot cake being on the menu. So it was it was George Washington, you know, this very tearful farewell that he said. Mm-hmm. He was off saying he, he was he was then heading off to 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 the Continental Congress, was it? Anyway, he said he said thank you to all his to all his um all his his commanders in this. You can go to the room. You can go to the yeah. room where this happened. You can go to the room. You can see the notebook. It was a French guy who worked in intelligence for in Washington's Continental Army that um that, that recorded the meal and recorded the carrot cake. You're not only a food critic, you're a food historian. Oh, I like, I like you. I love you. got everything. But, but, but I think that whole thing, I mean, how good is it to know that? And also, but also it, it changes the significance of you giving me carrot cake. Yes. Because it's, good, because it's got an American antecedent. And you can go, and that's kind of, you know, an American. It's like, it's like drinking wine. You want to know where the wines come from. You want to know the bit of the story of how it's made and everything else. Like there's, it's not just the taste of it. It's actually the whole story that comes from and, and it, and it actually can, making it. And it connects you through. It connects you straight through to... To, to history and and gives you a sense of how how ancient some of these some of these recipes are. You know, mm. it's fa- it's fantastic. It's fantastic. So anyway, I'm very excited. Yeah, All right. we're, excited. we're gonna do it at the very end. But before that, yeah. we're gonna do fan questions. Yeah, great. We're gonna smash through these. But actually, great. we need to answer the first two questions I asked you at yeah, the beginning sure. of this. And I'm gonna give you, give you a reminder. One mm-hmm. first question: What's your easy go-to dish that impresses anyone that anyone can make? Well, look, look assuming they're not vegetarians, and, yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I mean, you know, there are there are things like we can do for them. But I think the simplest thing to do. Lamb shoulder, mm. um, grind up some coriander seed, some cumin seed, um, rub it over the lamb shoulder, um, 200 degree oven for, oven for half an hour, and then put the temperature right down, 120, 140, and slow cook it. So slow cook lamb shoulder, it'll fall apart off the bone, and then with that, some salads. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe a kind of like a, a couscous salad or a quinoa salad or a frica salad, um, but loaded with pomegranates and mm. pistachios and current soaked in musket or tea and um, maybe a bit of feta. So lots of so lots delicious. of kind of texture and, and the flavor with the lamb shoulder and then some flatbread. And you can either eat it like a salad with, with some meat on the side or you can put, the, put everything into the flatbread and roll it up and away you go. I'm getting nervous now about this carrot cake after you're describing <laughs> that. <laughs> the second question: What is the weirdest thing you have in your kitchen at the moment? Um, I'll give you. I'll give you a bit to try. It's an. Mm. It's an Afghan. It's a hard Afghan cheese, and it looks like. Afghan it looks like a. It looks a bit like rabbit droppings, large rabbit droppings. Oh, really? But they're, but they're white, <laughs> and it smells slightly of smells slightly of feet. Of these, but they're designed. This this cheese is, you know, that whole like, the whole brilliance of, of humanity to be able to preserve mm. um, things for a long time. This cheese can be preserved for a long time. That's probably that. I've also got some parmesan crusts um, infusing. Any weird like tool you use to cook? Oh uh, no, no. I'm pretty for me. The things you need is a potato peeler. Um, a, a microplane and a silicon spatula. I don't. I don't. I own a mandolin, maybe for slicing things th- thinly. Yeah. I don't. I'm not a big fan of the kind of like. A, I'm now going to get my melon baller out, mm. my Parisian scoop. I'm now going to get out my um my prawn de vela, <laughs> my my zucchini cora. So now I, I've got. I've probably got all those things. Yeah, embarrassingly, yeah. I don't use got them too much. But I don't. Just where the kids get fussy. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, so. Well, that's right. Got, well, no, no. The the, 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 the we, we had to put a we we had we 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 redid the kitchen. 
Sweden about six years ago, mainly so we could have somewhere for me to put my poppy seed grinder and my mm. my my strange um, Sardinian gnocchi machines, <laughs> uh, which never get used. But the more art pieces, I think. Well, yeah, that's right. There, there are pieces that live in live in live in a cupboard, um, but no, most most of the stuff. Most of the stuff I cook, most recipes I write, they're designed. They're designed to be, you know, you standard, standard rental kitchen. You know, yeah. because you don't want to tell people to use a ice cream machine because ninety percent of people don't have them. You don't tell, yeah. tell them that, to use a to use a kind of some weird weird sort of Bavarian um, horse castrating knife because no one's got, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, they yeah. Make it so that everything should be about making it. And then the same thing with ingredients, same thing with ingredients. I, I don't, I've got no recipe for that weird Afghani cheese in any of my books <laughs> because I, I want people to to be able to go, I, I've got, probably got them in the fridge and if I don't, I can, I can go to my local supermarket and I can yeah. probably pick it up. How good. Well, we'll get back to the fan questions. Um, first one. You have over 400 cravats. I yes. haven't actually talked about these. And yes. how many, what's the count now? And how many suits do you have? Because uh, um, we know we, you love your fashion. Yeah, like, cravats, cravats have probably gone down to about two, about, no, about 100 now. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a mass cull uh, because I just don't have space. Are the kids and, and, still wearing them? Um, no. <laughs> no, but, but but people do come around as they did on Saturday, come around going, I'm going to a cravat party. And I go, that's a, and, and, and do you have a cravat? I'm going, yes, you're very lucky I do have one. So, so they get lent out, sent out. Um, suits, I do have about... 50 different suits. Yeah. I love my suits. Yeah, yeah. Almost more than the cravats. Are, for, those cravats, right? They're just material often from the the remainder bin of the op suit. shop, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean I've, we've found a couple of young Australian uh, indigenous designers and we've got some cravats from from them for, or scarves from them, which we, which I'm wearing in MKR, wow. which is lovely to do. Um, but 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 often they're just, it's literally just a, a an edge bit of material. So it's not the same. A good suit, as you know, you're a man of style, a beautifully mm -hmm. cut suit, you know, and, and I mean that I'm very. I, I do love the fact that I do love the fact that everything I wear, from the you know the R.M. Williams boots to the the shirts from Ganton to the suits made in by Pino Prinzi in Brunswick here in Melbourne, it's all Australian made. And mm -hmm. I think that's that. I, I've been very proud over the last twenty years to 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 do that and to to support those guys. Um, and it's great because they're just beautifully made things. Yeah. You know, just that it makes I, you feel good wearing. Oh my too, gosh! You know? the, 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 I've got a, I've got a couple of new suits that we had made from KR that are just. I put them on and just go. Well, stand up taller, eh? They, they you stand do. Up taller. Broad shoulders. I like, like, oh, yeah, the, sh the shoulders are good. Quarter. <laughs> I, I, it, it drops twenty kilos off you. I'm like, you know, the, it's it, it's a you, you look good. It's um, the, the the fabrics are, are interesting, and I think the great thing we live in an a, a, age now in Australia where people are men are so much more adventurous mm. about what they'll wear. Yeah. You know, in the old days, it was a maybe a comedy tie on Fridays, and it was maybe a comedy a Hawaiian shirt for the barbecue. But now you'll see men in checks, in in multiple coloured shirts, in um, you know, uh, socks or no socks. I, I, the the way of the Australian male dresses now compared to say when I first arrived in Australia thirty years ago, it has so changed it beyond recognition. Yeah, beyond recognition. Now, I actually, was going to wear a cravat to this. But I've come to the realization cravats are not easy to find. No, they're not. I was no, they're not. I called probably 15 and 20 places. Now that you told me that, I was like, I wish I would have called them. And, and they're long. really expensive. They pay about 100 bucks for a cravat. It's like, it was, no. The one place I found, 200 bucks. Oh, yeah, there you go. Where, where's the resolution? You can go down You can go down to the op shop and you go, oh, that's a nice bit of material. Just <laughs> you know, and, and that, that's one of the, the fun with the fashion has been exactly doing that, you know, yeah. of the of the stuff that I've worn over the last 15 years. You know, they a, a lot of the originally, the original pants I was wearing, these crazy high Harlequin type Argyle check pants. They all came out of um, John Daly's golf pants. Oh company. my god! And they were and they were <laughs> and they were John Daly, and they were like ninety bucks a pair. Um, they were so they were cheap, and they and they came in all these crazy colours and pants. Oh, so we cold. looked there, and then and then we bought some. Then there were a few tartan pairs we bought from a uh, like an army disposal store for like yeah. fifty bucks from Scotland. Um, and then and then then the the last batch, all these I bought. I went through this phase of wearing, which I still love, these broad striped pants. So I've got yeah, a beautiful yeah. leg Collingwood pants, black and white, oh, stripes about those, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. I've, got, I've got the Collingwood ones, mm -hmm. I've got pink and white ones, I've got blue and white, I've got so North Melbourne style, <laughs> <but> yellow, <laughs> yellow. What a bit you're yellow, going white, you know, you, I, I can go. But uh, that's all That's all made with, they're all made with um, Ikea 
cut in February. Really? Uh, I was doing it. Oh, that is a hot take. Uh, I did not know that. I was, I was going to an <laughs> Ikea event. I was wandering through and I was wondering who they went. I mean, that curtain fabric is pretty good. How much is that? I was like, seven bucks a meter. <laughs> oh, I've got an idea here. Gee, <laughs> gee, that's cheap. And, and, they, and they, they hang very well. So, I'm, so yeah. So, <laughs> so, so a lot of it, you know, on one side, there's the kind of the, the la di da properly made suit and the, the, the properly made shirt. On the other hand, it's like, let's save the money in other ways and, and find cheap fabrics rather than the stuff that's come out of a, a little croft somewhere in Scotland. You never walked into someone's house and didn't been matching something of the furniture, <laughs> have you? <laughs> Would be, could, be, could be very easy. I... I, I have I have walked into places and found that the clothes the suit I'm wearing perfectly matches the background and I kind of blur into the background like it's can't go to the kitchen the curtains That's right, you know, I, if, if there's one of those feature walls in duck egg blue and I'm the suit can easily just drift straight in it is it is you know that it is it is a yeah no look, but I, 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 I it's been it's been one of the great joys has been has been to not take it too seriously and to and to wear wear stuff and i love the and i love the the social media um interaction of you know matt preston dressed today like the man from del monte matt matt preston dressed today like a colombian drug lord matt <laughs> preston dressed today like a care bear you know there, there's a there's a Headlines great galore. Yeah, well, well it's just i just like that idea of people having fun with what you do yeah you know and, and you know you know what it's like that there's the social media is a is a two-edged sword it can be really bitchy mm. and it can also be really funny yeah. And and you would have had that with some with with, so with when you started wearing the goggles. Yeah. Now we all know the really serious reason why you're wearing the goggles. But some of those comments were really funny. Oh, hilarious. Some of, like, some of them were, were horrible and bitchy and disgusting. But the funny ones are actually you come oh, and embrace good. them. Yeah. And you go great, good on you, nice work. Oh, that's I like so that. true. Well, we'll smash through some of these because we've yep, got right. a few here, so we'll, we'll make this yeah, quick, quick. But what's your cheat meal, and what's your fast food meal that you would go out and have? Um, I'd probably go for I'd probably go for pizza. Um, and if I'm looking for, for fast, fast, it'll be ideally small family run, you know, uh, Front line uh, yeah, I, I look, I'm, uh, yeah, well, well, I'm a little yeah, shout out. Yeah, yeah, front, 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 no, I love front liners. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I, I think, I think pizza is the ultimate food. You know, it's, you need it in one hand. It's got all the, all the, all the food, all the food groups in one, in one place, in one slice. What a great idea. Um, and I don't mind, a, I don't mind a burger. I don't yeah. mind a burger for someone like Andrews. Very nice. Um, what's your favorite dish you've ever had on MasterChef? Because I watched a video of you and I thought it was the best outro into a commercial I've ever seen in my life. And it was you. You had a, a plate in front of you and you looked at it and you go, this is disgusting. Oh, and you threw it on the floor. The moment, yeah. And then it went, to, it, it went to break. And oh, I was like, my oh God. my gosh, I'm about to lose my mind. And no, I was just sitting on my edge of my seat. And then you come back and what do you say? I see. Yes. Then, then I went. That's disgusting. Disgustingly good. Classic. <laughs> classic. Classic. Um. TV misdirect. Experience. I'm not a fan of a misdirect. I got to say anymore. But but that 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 seems. I think now maybe because because the kids who are watching that were seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm. It's kind of had this weird second life now. And and I get I get pictures regularly from friends who are at events like Golden Plains or Beyond the Valley. Yeah. And there'll be a there'll be a Matt Preston holding a plate, <laughs> doof stick. <laughs> Wandering around the crowd, my, my my poor son who's my poor oldest son who's twenty one said he was at one of those events three in the morning and there's his dad floating oh, no. above the crowd. <laughs> it's like your world's worst nightmare. Take it away from this. Oh. Well, on, on a doof stick, really, dad. <laughs> and and I, I quite I think there's a suitability given that doof is food backwards. I think that kind of makes sense. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that 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 was. I don't know. Look, there's so there are, there is so many in terms of in terms of. Um, the the kind of the they were invariably they were invariably you know there was one guy that put a little bit of licorice in a licorice in a in a in a red wine sauce for, for steak that was a really clever idea okay. another guy smoked smoked butter and used that for another sauce that was really delicious oh. then there were you know then there were there were certain you know, there were slow cooked ribs and there was a Alvin Choir has been on the recent series did a great uh, a great dish called drunken and brews that was really really delicious kind of like a, a, a Asian chicken dish, I think, but but they, you know, there there have been of the year over the years. There have been there have been so many spectacular stuff. A lot of the stuff that Billy cooked was a bakate that that um was a bakate that we when we did a an event we we went to Japan and we filmed under Mount Fuji. One of the amazing yeah. things we did. Um, and we got Mount Fuji like here in the background, and and um, Sarah Thiong, uh, bought this kind of version of bakate. Um, out that was kind of like it's a traditional Chinese Hong Kong Chinese Hong or Singaporean Chinese dish. Um, it's a kind of a, it's a it's a soup, and it was like 
unbelievable. I mean, yeah. that, that that was really that was very memorable. But it's hard when you know we got that kind of cause you got the memory of the dish, and you also got the memory of the location place and the as people well. and everything That's else. Really yeah. Now. Um, you can give a shout out here. Best restaurant in Melbourne. Oh, um, uh, this is under the pump here, but you can give give one of probably your list of a hundred. Okay, well, uh, who's paying? Who's paying? Um, you're paying Vida Mond. I'm paying Vida Mond Love that. Okay, if um uh, if friends are coming from interstate at the moment, probably Gimlet because it's super cool. What about Anthony um, Albanese's playing? Um, I found the Abbey's. <laughs> you mean and as a, I, I, I love I love Embla. I love Marion. Um, my my other two places I've been to recently I really like Serai, which is yep. um kind of crazy uh, Portuguese kind of barbecue. Um, Hope Street Kitchen, Hope Street Radio is really good. I enjoy that because it's got a great vibe, yep. great seating outside. Um, Tulum's fantastic. I mean, you know, it's a bit like it's a bit like asking it's a bit like asking um catherine murphy i do the the sports side of the radio show for her favorite rugby union player because she's going to go on she's going to go on for three or four days just yeah. listing another owen farrell and you know and 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 um so yeah they, they, they we're very lucky very lucky in Melbourne. but then you know then in sydney brisbane adelaide we've got yeah. we're very lucky to have some spectacular places to eat and a really high standard i've just come back from london and i ate at four well-known places and i reckon uh i could pick a number of places in any of those cities that were better yeah those well-known places yeah you know cool places to go it's melbourne's the multicultural capital of the world melbourne's like. amazing but, but but there's also amazing food in adelaide there's amazing food yeah. in, in brisbane there's great food in perth you know so we're, we're we're lucky there's great also great food in ballarat and mm. there's great food in you know uh noosa i think kind of a, or in Byron or in newry bar so we're you know we're lucky there's fantastic food all over this country we're we're, we're in a kind of a sweet spot at the moment if you were to dress up for a dress-up party, who mm -hmm. would you dress up as? <laughs> I'll let you think on that one. I'll go to the next one. Oh, I think I think Manu would be fun because I'd, be <laughs> I'd just be able to do the French accent and I'd be able to carry some sauce with me. A little jar of my, this is my, my sauce. I think that would be funny. That would be funny. Love that. Um, well, first, so I'd say someone's going on a first date. What should they cook? First date? Mm. Something they've cooked before. Love that. Something something that isn't heavy, something that's light. So, you know, whether it's um whether it's like uh, something that the other person likes, mm. don't don't bring them don't bring them a smoked salmon and um, don't go crazy. and avocado salad if they don't like smoked salmon. Yeah. So I think that but but they're the three things. Light, something they like. Um, but it, and again, don't stress about it. Yeah. Don't stress yeah. about it. And not too much, you know. It's a, so I mean I think I think, you know, start with a salad. Start with a salad. Easy. Yeah, it's good. Good if it's stuffed with 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 fingers. Asparagus, asparagus, poached egg, shaved shaved um shaved parmesan. Mm. Yeah, simple. Worst cooking mistake because I've made one. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but worth kale in the oven too long and oh, I forgot it was in there. Only burnt it. Smoked the whole. Yeah, house that would up. be that. That <laughs> would be that would be bad. Um, oh, undoubtedly doing making biscuits and mixing the salt and the sugar up because I was rushing. Not good. <laughs> that's really, not that bad that's really, really not that oh bad no, my God. God cooks every day those, I feel those, like. <laughs> those, those cookies that, those, those cookies were those cookies were, were terrible um best way to cook chicken and steak i know i someone else recently asked you this he said use a thermometer now yeah. would you say chicken poached grilled what's the best way you reckon to actually taste chicken no, look, I, mean, I mean i think if you're talking about a date meal i think poached chicken is really good but i think it's mm. i think you're gonna white poach it so bring your bring your water with your your or your stock with your aromatics to the boil then put your breast in and then lid lid off leave it 45 minutes and you should get this lovely silky set breast which is fantastic that's a great way of cooking poached chicken for me it, i mean i think that and you know because again i'm I've got, I've got kids. I think one of the great, you know, the go-tos, I've got three of them um, into a, two major, let's, let's do the two major ones. Chicken thigh. Yeah. Um, cut into, each side cut into six pieces. Um, toss, it, toss it in melted butter and then toss it in panko breadcrumbs with grated parmesan and thyme and you'll get these little nuggets. Bake them in the oven. Bake them in the oven for about 10 minutes, uh, 180, and then those nuggets can be eaten like nuggets in a in a comb with mayo and sriracha. Oof. They can be put into wraps. They're really simple. And the same, exactly the same idea, um, mix up 
a cup of peanut butter, like half a cup of hosin sauce, some mirin together, uh, mix it up, and then again, same thing, marinate your chicken thighs in that, and then 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 spread them out on a lined baking sheet into a hot oven um, for the you know, same thing, 15, 10, 15 minutes. And, and then knowing what with both those – Turn the grill up and put them mm. and get the edges nice and charry and sticky. Um, and that too, you get that lovely, almost like satay flavor. Yeah. And, then, and so, so that's, that's like, you know, that's five minutes of prep and, and the oven's doing most of the work. You can, you can, you can chop up your, your, your lettuce or your, or your nice slaw if your lettuce is too expensive, mm. um, with, with drumhead cabbage while the, while the, while the chicken's cooking. So that's really good. Steak. Um, I don't, I really don't eat a lot of, I really don't eat a lot of, um, steak, but I got two ways, uh, porterhouse, there's a, there's a great, uh, there's, um, there's a great Malaysian thick soy called, um, ketchup manis, okay. toss, toss the steak and ketchup manis on a, on the barbecue grill. And what you'll do is the ketchup manis is sweet and it'll form a bark and you can cook. So you can get like a crusty bark on the outside of the steak, oh, yeah. but can still keep the steak really like rare and blue in the middle yeah, yeah, which, yeah. I, which i love which is great well, over your two minute noodles um the the other the other way the other way i look i'm i'm a rather than steak i'd rather go pork neck yeah okay so get pork neck which is cheap slice it really th- like freezer to chill it right down slice it really thinly bit of salt on it and then just on the barbecue really quickly like you know to sear Serious. each side yep. and then into a taco with some oh. pineapple and corn salsa maybe a bit of avocado and that's genius, and it's really cheap, and it's you know, and it's good. I'm not a massive fan of the big the big steak, but you know, yeah, okay. the, the the rule with the steak is as hot as possible, yeah. as hot as possible. Okay. One side, one side until the color comes. When you look at the edge of the steak, you can you see it changing color from like red to red to beigey brown. Mm. When the color gets halfway up the steak, um, check where your time is. Say it's four minutes. Flip it over, and then do half the time on the other side. Two minutes on the other side, and then you should get a medium rare steak every time. That is phenomenal. Now, if you're not hungry by now, <laughs> I'm starving. I'm about to go have lunch. Right? Last question: What's for dinner, what's for dinner tonight? I don't know. Actually, there's absolutely there's literally because my family's been away. There's literally nothing in the cupboard. We've just thrown away some old some old um, sushi rolls. Terrible sin. They didn't get eaten. <laughs> so I'm thinking tonight. What do you have? We had carbonara the night before. Um, so it won't be pasta. I'm thinking it might be it might be those little chicken nuggets. Huge. In wrap and I think in wraps, it's quick, it's easy. Um, and whenever the kids are uh, drift back in, there'll be some waiting in the oven for them. So good. Well, that's it from the fans' questions. I just want to say, first of all, you should be super proud of everything you've done. I like doing this research. You've done oh, that many different been, things from you, radio, TV, and sure. food, and everything else. It's so impressive. Mm-hmm. I've got friends from all over the world that know who you are, and you've been so successful and do it in such a positive manner. I think is something that everyone kind of you know is attracted to. And I, I really appreciate you coming on, man. It's been an amazing talk. No. We're gonna have this carrot cake. I'm, I'm so excited. We're gonna try it, and that'll yeah. be maybe a little extra bonus bit to this podcast. Yeah. But yeah. Um, seriously, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute honor. Uh, learned a lot in this. Learned a lot, and there's uh, a lot of things I've just put on my menu. I think <laughs> just good one chat. So I'm, 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 I'm expecting. I'm expecting images. Tag, also, yeah, there'll tag be a, a lot of content tag, coming tag your me, way. Thank you, Matt Scravat. It's, it's good to see. No, look, it's a pleasure, Mason, and it's a and it's always a joy to talk with someone who who loves their food. And it's it's always lovely to to be going around town and and see your your small unimposing frame some, <laughs> sitting on some <laughs> corner table, going, "Is that Mason Cox?" Folded up, like folded up, like, folded up, like, like origami in the corner. Oh yeah, it is. No, it's great. It's great, Mason. Congratulations on on the show. It's really good. Really yeah. enjoyed doing it. Thank Thanks you so much. much. You have to come around for the next Thanksgiving dinner. I do. Uh, I I can't wait. Candied yams. Yep. Uh, We've got the whole thing. Do the full spread. Deep fried, deep fried turkey. Nah, I don't have big enough fat here. Don't think I've had the whole bag, you know, eight hours, whatever it is. Yeah. It's a full thing. It's yeah, a full great. day. Fantastic. But like you said before, it's about the people you surround yourself with. Yeah, so. no, I don't, I'd, I'd love that. I love that. Thanksgiving Day. November 22nd? Uh, 25th. 25th? I think, yeah. That's a question mark. I'm not 100% sure. Oh, my that. God. Do you today's, know this? Look, yeah. today's 4th of July. That's all I know. <laughs> We're doing right. a good on 4th of July. Do, do, so happy 4th of July. Do, do, <laughs> I'm trying do, to get away from the fact do, I don't know what day Thanksgiving is. Does, does Thanksgiving change? With, Maybe with it's the same? Thursday. Maybe it's the is last Thursday. Is that what it is? Oh, right? Is that what it is? When oh, we'll, 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 we'll put it in the next. We'll put it in the next. You go next. We're going to work out when Thanksgiving is because you know I've just had an I've just had an invitation for dinner at Mason's house and I'm quite excited about that. The day that's good. It's just, <laughs> <laughs>